Yeah. Hi everyone, you're welcome to today's. Can please can you all hear me? Signify if you can hear me. Yes. I believe everyone can hear me. Yes. All right, you're welcome to today's session of November to remember. Um, as we all know, this program started on the 1st of November and is going to run through the month of November. Um, we've had series of, um, we've had two speakers so far for the first, um, for the first session and the second session. It's the, it's the third session today. And I'm so glad to have every one of us around here, my fellow students, our lecturers and our guest speaker for today. So please, you can just um, try and look into the list of participants. If there's anyone you think should be here and they are not here yet, you can just inform them and let them know we've started. And trust me, you don't want to miss this session. You don't want to miss this business. All right, um, before we go ahead, I would like to hand over to Dr. Celestine to give us um, a welcome speech, a welcome address. Okay, um, representing uh, Sam, the head of school, um, for, uh, she's uh, unavoidably absent today, and then uh, she sends a message. Uh, so, can you move to your microphone? Manchester City face RB Leipzig. Liverpool taking on Real Madrid with the first leg of Anfield. Tottenham take on the Italian champion. Okay. Can you move to your microphone? Oh. Okay. So, like we have gathered here. You know, this program has brought the best of the best to better your best. And, you know, it's going to be very great. We welcome every one of you on behalf of the head of school, Sam Johnson, and the dean. We want to say you're welcome to this uh, third episode of November to Remember. Back again to the moderators. All right. So, um... We have to do a little introduction of our guest speaker. I'm very sure looking at the flyer, we have some of you might have a little idea of who she is already, and some might not even know who she is. So we'll be doing us um, a big favor by reading a, a little biography of our guest speaker for today. Mujibala, can we have your face? Sorry, quick one, please. Everyone should try and mute themselves so we can all hear us clearly. Please. Try and mute your mic, please. So we can hear ourselves. Try and mute your mic, please. Oh, the block. Oh, the block. Yeah, so that was said that on Thursday. 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 Friday. 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 The founder and the co founder of the team for the Planet Alliance. She's passionate about data for good and how we can use data for fairer outcomes for people and the planet. KMOB is a market insight platform, gathering public sentiment data through popular each mobile games. Isn't that interesting? To better understand how people feel about the, go um, the global goals and what actions we should take to make better decisions for people and the planet. The company has collected data for the world's largest survey on climate altitude, the UNDP, the People Climate Board. So if you're looking at my screen now, you'll see the link. I don't want to go through all of those things. And then I'm going to, I'm reading for that. She confounded the planning for the Planet Alliance, which is now 30 plus members the world's largest player in the gaming space. 
including PlayStation. I'm sure a lot of us are uh, familiar with PlayStation, Xbox, Unity, Supercell, Rovio, um, Nancy, Dress Through, Great Mind Games, and even though I'm not so familiar with some of these, but you know, so with collection reach of about 1.4 billion monthly active users, Jude is voted one to work in 2015 at the Talent Unleashed Awards judged by Sir Richard Branson and leaders in tech. Voted top 100 women in tech in Europe, growing business, young girls 2012, and shortlisted on Red Hot Women Awards 2012, and runner of Young Entrepreneur of the Year 2012. Built Flame Up, I mean, she built Flame Up up to be winner of Best Startup 2012 launch conference, BBAA Social Investment of the Year 2013, and Digital Leader SME 2014. Interesting. She is a Buster Games judge, member of um, UK Interactive Entertainment, and speaker at various events such as um, Project, Web Summit, The Next Web, Mid Festival, um, Six W, Women in Games, Browser Games Forum, Games for Brands, London Games Conference, Social Games Summit, and Tech Partake. Um, this is very interesting, and I cannot wait to hear from her. Thank you, Thank everyone. You, everyone. Yes, everyone, just like you've heard Mojibola, our speaker for today is super packed. So without wasting much of our time, Let's welcome Jude for today's business. You're welcome, Jude. Over to you. Hi, thank you very much. And yeah, good, good to be here. Good to see everyone. Um, you too. I'm just going to bring up my, uh, my screen. Um, so I've got a, a presentation to make today, but also I want to leave some time at the end for any questions. Um, so if you do have any burning questions, please pop them into the, um, pop them into the chat um, or we can you can bring them up at, at the end. So happy to do it either way. So first of all, I just want to make sure that you can see the slideshow. Um, can everyone see that? Okay. Yes. Perfect. Yes, okay. we can. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I am... Um, my name is Jude. I'm the founder and CEO of Playmob, and thank you so much for the for the introduction. I think you've kind of given my my um twenty years uh, history there, so I don't need to really talk about um who I am. But I thought I'd maybe kind of talk about some of the bits that I hadn't um really covered and how I got into the space of of um gaming for good and how we can unleash the power of play. I just thought a bit of background and history in terms of um where I kind of came up with some of the ideas and how it's evolving and where it is today um, is basically the theme of this presentation. So I got into gaming when I went to Abate University. Abate University were one of the first in the world to have a computer games course. I know Bolton is, is excellent in gaming as well. Um, but in 1997, Abate created the first games course, which I didn't do. I did a master's in marketing, um, but I, I was really fascinated in what they were doing at the at the university, um, especially around how they were growing entrepreneurs and an entrepreneurial ecosystem and really kind of lever leveraging um, the, the history of gaming, um, which had come from the city of Dundee. So Abate University is in Dundee in Scotland, so that's where I'm originally from. I'm now down um, just outside London. Um, but the the history of gaming in Dundee was that the Lemmings originated from Dundee, the very first Grand Theft Auto um, came from the city, and more recently um, Minecraft or console was de developed in the city as well. So we have a really rich heritage in gaming, you know, lots of people kind of getting into the space, you know, a thousand game stu students come out of the course per year. We're creating an entrepreneurial ecosystem and then the entrepreneurs who go on to, to do extremely well um, end up investing back into the, um, the, the, the future entrepreneurs and future game ideas are coming from the city. Um, so that's kind of my, my history and where, where I've come from. Um, but the, when, when I was at Aberdeen University, I got involved in 
a, a startup who were developing games for education and training. And so that's where I really saw how you can use games for another purpose other than just pure entertainment, how you can use games for, for learning, for engaging, and for motivating, for training. Um, and so I spent about kind of 10 years in that space of looking at games for education and training. But in 2010, um, I read this book by Jane McGonagall called Reality is Broken. And so she was really looking at how, you know, how games can make us better and how they can change the world. So this is quite a revolutionary book. If you've not read it, definitely read it. And she's got a few sub subsequent books that have come out since then. Um, so I definitely think if you're interested in this space, so if, people, if people can mute the mics, that would be great. Um, thank you. fabricated a scene where the woman king was saying that they should stop doing using slavery. Sorry, it's still quite noisy. <laughs> and go to palm oil. Totally made up. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, so if you're interested in this space, definitely look at Jane's books because they are they, they are revolutionary and some of her work is great as well. But one of the things that caught my attention was that in her books, she said that at the time, this was kind of 2010, we were spending 3 billion hours per week playing games. And if we were to get to 21 billion hours per week, we can start to solve some of the world's most pressing problems like climate change, poverty, obesity. Now, the how wasn't quite there but the ambition was there and gaming was only going to go one way. We'd seen it already rise and we were at the point of social gaming. Um, this was pre-mobile gaming, really. And this was when games were starting to become bigger on Facebook, but it was only going to go one way. And I think one thing that games have, have shown us is that they are recession proof, pandemic proof, um, you know, they're a cost effective form of entertainment for all. And the more that we've got access to smartphones around the world, the more that we've got access to the internet, the more people are going to play. So the numbers are only going to go one way. Um, and right now we're at about 3.2 billion people playing games globally. Um, when we play, we're 98% engaged. The market is worth more than music and film combined. We're at about $178 billion right now. And, and again, that's going up. And that doesn't include ad revenue or ad spend. Um, so it's about another 100 on top of that um, for that particular part of the market. Um, so that was the quote I gave earlier. I kind of skipped over that. Um, but another thing happened in 2010 that really caught my attention in terms of how games could be used for good. And, you know, I was kind of percolating what Jane had said, you know, how games could be used um, to solve these world problems. And in 2011, um, Zynga, who made Farmville, launched uh, an initiative to raise money for the victims of the earthquake in Haiti. And again, this was pre-mobile. This was only on Facebook at the time, um, but their numbers were huge. And basically what they did was they launched items. Um, obviously, you, in a free-to-play game, you get in-app purchases or in-game items that people can buy um, to play the game. So they launched a particular set of items that players could buy to raise money for uh, victims of the earthquake. Now, 50% of the what was raised, uh, what was spent on the items, was then donated to charities. But the impact this had was phenomenal. They raised uh, $1.5 million in five days. Um, and this was from one item. This was selling the, the sweet seed for Haiti item. And they went on to, to do more of this because the founder realized that, you know, not only were they raising money for a good cause, which was incredible, players were really oh, engaged with it as well. Uh, players were getting behind it. They were engaging more. First time people, first time spenders were spending, people were spending more, people were putting more on um, social media. So there was a real um, a real deep engagement with players, which is really important for game studios as well. And so this caught my attention in terms of how you can use existing games to make, to make real world impact, rather than kind of developing games from scratch, which was the area which I had come from. Um, and so Zynga had gone on to do more, um, to more to do more in this space and then the um oops that this is what kind of set me to let uh this is what led me to setting up play mob because my thinking was around okay if we can use these existing games to engage with existing player bases we can educate them on global and local issues find out what they care about raise money for good causes the audiences are already there and so if we can really figure out how this could work for both Impact and Game Studio, 
then it's a win-win model. So the, the idea for PlayMob was to create this platform to integrate into existing games, to be able to raise money for, for causes and raise awareness of what needed, um, what needed to be done. Um, so 2012 set PlayMob up to do just exactly that. So we kind of went on the, the typical startup journey of um, raising money. We went through Techstars Accelerator, we raised investment um, and we built our platform. And in the, in the few years that we kind of concentrated on this model, um, we raised over $2 million for charity. Um, and we worked with some of the biggest studios and games in the world. So we worked with um, the, the Sims, so Electronic Arts, we worked with Plants vs Zombies. Um, we worked with Rovio through Angry Birds, we worked with Supercell, Amazon, Ubisoft, you know, all the big names were getting involved, which was really, really exciting. Um, and what we were learning was, um, that gamers really did want to do good. So again, this was kind of going back to what Zynga had found out when they were initially running um, their campaigns was that players were engaging more. We were also finding the same. And so we find this kind of this um, movement in not just gamers, but consumer mindsets in terms of they wanted to buy products and services that were not just giving them the what they needed at the time, but also giving them um, a way to make impact in the world, a really easy way to do it as well. Um, and some of it could have been offsetting guilt of playing games. <laughs> you know, if you spend a few hours playing games, then this was a nice thing to do. And for others, it was a, a way to do something if they felt helpless about um, a situation. Um, but the this was all backed up by the Charity Aid Foundation in 2017, when they did their own study on gamers to look at how, how gamers wanted to make a difference. And what they found was that 58% of gamers um, were all interested in donating while they play. 55% um, would make an in-game purchase if they knew it was linked to a charity. And 87% think that developers are ideally placed to raise awareness of social and charity issues. So there's really high percentages in terms of how many um, gamers wanted to do more of this. And these numbers have only gone up since 2017. Um, but we um, we actually pivoted away from raising money for charity because we we had a couple of issues and one was although we had the big players on board it wasn't continuous um, and also we were finding that we were kind of missing a step and the step before that was um, finding out what people really care about before you ask them to do something like donate to a good cause so we we decided to kind of really look at our model around 2015 2016 so we raised money you know it was working um but it was very campaign driven and so we were looking at how do we make that much more sustainable so that we can be generating a bigger impact and was raising money what we um felt was the biggest way to make an impact um so we started really kind of experimenting with what else games could do and what else we could do with the technology that we'd built um so in 2015, we, we had the opportunity to work with Project Everyone. So Project Everyone are an NGO who um, were set up to make the goals famous. They were set up by Richard Curtis, who's a film, uh, film director. He did um, Four Weddings and a Funeral. Um, and you'll, you'll probably know the name, but he, he knows how to make things famous. <laughs> and uh, when the Global Goals launched, he wanted to make sure that they were on everyone's radar. And so we looked at what they were doing and when they were making the goals famous, they were doing things like the world's biggest prayer, the world's biggest cinema ad, the world's biggest lesson, but they didn't have anything going on in the gaming space. And so we said, look, let us reach out to our game developer community and see if we can just switch on some messaging in game. Now the easiest way to do this would have been through um, in-game advertising. So games monetize in two ways. One is through in-app purchase. And the second is through advertising. So we thought if we can get in through that route, we can ask, ask our development partners if they um, have you know, uh, remnant ads or, or home ads, um, which are essentially the ads that are not being used. And if we can use those ads to try and get out to as many people as possible, one, it gives the developers um, extra ads to show. Um, and two, it will give us awareness across a, a broad reach of games. So we ended up with about over um, 20 studios involved and basically just provided them with assets like visuals and videos that they can put into their ad space. 
and we launched through the week of the Global Goals launching. And um, in that time, we we managed to reach 110 million people. Um, and that was in one week. And then we had a 12.5% click-through rate, rate of players wanting to find out more about the goals. So this, this was really, really high and, and proved the fact that we can actually get gamers to participate in um, not just fundraisers, but when they want to learn more about something, we've got their attention, um, which was really, really powerful. And so that's kind of what's led to what PlayMob is today. So we've um, we've become we've moved away from the fundraising model, but using our platform as a way to be able to talk to gamers about things that they care about. So essentially at the core it's insights and data so we're having a conversation about what they care about finding out um, their sentiment on global and local level and being able to provide this back to organizations who can make decisions uh, or, or who are making decisions uh, and putting people at the heart of the decision making um, so we could provide the data back to governments um, ngos and um, industry as well but it, only, it can only be used for, for esg esg and impact um, so with the scale that we have and also the way that we can target um, very um, precise kind of targeted groups of people, it's a really powerful way to start opening up conversations in an anonymous way. So there's no press information. Um, it's all anonymized, um, but, but we have some information about demographics so that we can make a link between who might be responding and what they're responding with so that we can feed this into the decision making process. Um, so the way the way the models work it, used now, and I think you know I'm showing this because I want to show an, a, a different example of how games can be used for impact, how games could be used to be game changing. Um, there's four components of of our, our platform, well three, and then an outcome. And the first is we um, so we've leveraged off of the model of using advertising to engage with players, and essentially we've built a a quiz game as a playable advert so a 30 second little um, quiz that you can play um, it's inserted into media space within existing mobile games so we can target people based on where they are and who they might be um, so if, if an organization needs precise targeting we've oh. got that um, way to do that through ad networks we then launch the the quiz which is built being built with social science um, so that we can find out what people are saying um, and behaviors as well we launch that and then within 30 seconds and seven questions we've got a lot of data that tells us about people's knowledge sentiment and behavior on a topic so the first part is the quiz engine the second part is the distribution and the third part is the the data so we've been able to collect the data um, we do top line analytics we don't do any in-depth analytics but we can provide that data then back to organizations to make powerful decisions whether it be around policy strategy or operations um, so that's our way of of using games now and how we've changed from the fundraising model to the um, actions and outcomes model so the um so the data that we're essentially collecting covers these these areas so we're looking at kind of knowledge how much do people know about a topic sentiment how much do they care behavior like um what would they do uh, and looking at that over time to see if we can adjust or change behavior we're looking at truthfulness and data as well. So because this is an, is, is an advertising space, if someone is just speeding through just to get a reward, then we have to invalidate that data because it's not truthful. Um, but if they're taking their time and it's considered responses, then we can validate it. Um, and so for us, you know, it's really about getting that quality data um, rather than just lots of data. Um, you know, it has to be quality. Demographic data, so we don't ask any personal information, but we do ask someone um, some demographic information so that we could link that back to responses. Um, and we can look at data from the extremes of a, a level of confidence to a very rigorous kind of validating representative sampling data, um, which is something that we did with, with the UN, which I'll, I'll, I'll show you as a case study, which is this one. Um, so we, um, I thought I'd bring up a, a case study just to kind of bring it to life a bit more, but Mission 1.5 was something that we created with the United Nations. So the challenge UNDP had um, in 2019 was that the, 
the, the Paris, as part of the Paris Climate Change Agreement, each country had to make their commitment. They had to make, um, they had to put in place their national determined contribution, the NDCs. But the NDCs are not widely known and everyone on the planet hasn't read the, <laughs> the Paris Climate Change Agreement. Um, and it is very climate wonky. So how do we distill this down to a way that can make it um, easier to understand and relatable and help people make decisions about what policies that they would want to see happen um, to, to halt climate change or to stop the world from going another um, 1.5 degrees Celsius rising. So they came to us and said, look, we've noticed that when we get on the tube in the morning in New York, that everyone's on their phones playing Candy Crush. Um, and we saw what you guys are doing and we'd like to see how we can do something together to reach as many people in the world as possible, find out how they feel about climate change and then provide this data back to world leaders to help, um, help them make better decisions around climate policies so that we can put people's voices at the heart of the decision making and try and stop the world from rising another 1.5 degrees. And so this led to mission 1.5, which in the end was rolled out to 52 markets. But the first step was we we built the playable ad. Um, this it was a bit more kind of advanced than the um, the quiz engine that we have, but we had to scale it down to kind of a quiz engine because of the size of it. So they were ended up being two versions, one which was more visual, um, a bit took a bit longer to play, and it sits on the website, and that could be rolled out to markets as a as a web game. Um, and it could be used as educational um, material that could be used on social media. Um, but the, we also then created a, a very light version um, because in some of the markets that we were going into, the bandwidth wasn't, um, wasn't great. So we had to make sure that we built this to be as accessible for, for everyone as possible. Um, and in the end, we ended up reaching um, 52 markets. Um, in total, it was about 33 million people. Um, in terms of validated responses, because we had to, we worked at Oxford University and professional pollsters to validate the data. They also helped us set the parameters in terms of, we had to reach a particular amount of um, people per demographic bucket in each market. So there were 40, 48 demographic mar uh, buckets per market and there were 52 markets. And the numbers were all set by the professional pollsters so that we could make sure that we had a, a representative sample of each particular demographic per market. Um, and so when we rolled out, we had to do some um, targeting to make sure that we were able to reach um, the particular numbers that, uh, that were required for sampling. Um, and this was quite a fun part of the process as well, because this is where we were able to use lots of data and games to, to optimize. So, what we would do would be we'd roll out in a market, you'd start to see certain buckets fill up. So typically it was, you know, the 18 to 35 year olds that were filling up quite quickly. Once they'd filled up, if there were other buckets left unfilled, we had to switch off the buckets that had filled because we would got the numbers. And then we had to then push more into the games that were targeting those that were, um, the numbers weren't so high in. So for example, um, if we were trying to fill a bucket like in India, for example, of, 60 plus not in education, then we'd have to look at the sorts of games um, that that demographic would play and we'd push out the game into those games that uh, we, we thought were being played. So the likes of you know, Sudoku or crosswords or puzzle games um, would, would typically uh, target the kind of the, the 50, 60 plus market. So we had to just keep on continually optimizing to make sure that we got the, the exact number uh, or, you know, beyond the exact number of, of people. And that would then give us a, a confident level of data for that country. Um, the really exciting thing about this, so once it had rolled out, it was kind of the, you know, you might be thinking, well, so what? That was cool. We managed to reach so many people. Um, but what this fed into was really, really important. So it created the, the People's Climate Vote, which came out last year. And um, there's a general report called the People's Climate Vote. Um, and then there was one copy of a report per market that participated. Um, and then each of the each of the markets, the report went to the world leader um, so that they had the data in a report, a report so that they can start to make better decisions about climate change. And the hope was that 
we would then increase the commitments that were going into the national determined contributions. Um, this was um, this was really really well received. It got into about ninety um, press and media publications. Um, it was mentioned on I think on CNN when John Kerry was talking, and um, we got a really positive response. So it then led on to the People's Climate Vote for the G20. So the G20 had their own specific copy of this. Uh, and then just after that last year, sorry, this year, the data was used for the um, for the IPCC report, um, which for us was kind of the holy grail because finally, you know, the data, the, the data that we were collecting is from gamers, but gamers are people at the end of the day, the 3.2 billion people on the planet playing games. And so this was just another way to have a conversation with people and um, get them to speak up about climate change. I think the really interesting thing for us was that we were reaching all corners of the planet. If you look at the way mobile gaming is, you know, it's, um, it's grown quickly and many, many parts of the world, pretty much worldwide, uh, it's growing, but in a lot of developing countries, it's growing as well. You know, the more we've got smartphone penetration, the more internet connection. Gaming is a, a top um, activity that we do on our phones. So we were reaching people that hadn't been reached before. We were uh, talking to people who hadn't had a voice on climate change, um, although were badly affected by it. Um, we were talking to people who potentially couldn't vote. You know, maybe they were under underage to vote or just couldn't vote in their country or were too scared to vote. And the fact that games were uh, or games are, you know, a real personal moment on your mobile device, you know, you're not. Um, uh, it's you and the device, you know, you're fully engaged when you play, you're 98% engaged, you know, you're not multi-screening and you're not playing with anyone else unless you're playing a, a social mobile game. Um, so it's a real personal moment and we're not asking for any personal information. So there was nothing revealed about the, the, the personal identity of the person that was playing. So it was very groundbreaking when it came to you know, what the what the potential was, but we're just scratching the surface with what we can do here. Um, so that was quite an exciting moment for us. And this is all derived through through games with a game. Um, so that's kind of the, the history of Playmob and where, where we are today. And we continue to do more within the climate space. It's, it's one of the biggest areas for us. And in particular, kind of breaking it down now into looking at things like water shortages, um, energy, um, cost of living, you know, some of the big challenges that we're having uh, in, in the UK and globally, um, we can start applying this methodology to, to start engaging people to, um, to, to feed their voices into whether it be policy making, strategic decision making or operational decision making by the organisations that are having like water companies and energy companies or our governments. Um, so the ones that are making decisions about some of these big topics. Um, so we continue to do that, but something else that we were doing, and I know it was mentioned um, in my bio, was the um, the plane uh, for the Planet Alliance. I think oh, this was a video, but I don't think it's going to play. <laughs> so I'll, I'll talk through what it is. So it's now a collection of 49 game studios and publishers, including PlayStation, Xbox, Rovio, Supercell, Ubisoft. So they've got, Ubisoft have actually got um, 15 studios participating, which is really exciting. Um, Niantic, who make Pokemon Go. Um, collectively, we've got reach of 1.4 billion monthly active users. Um, and the, the point of the Alliance is that it's encouraging, um, it's, it's bringing the games ind industry together on one platform and looking at ways that we can encourage players to take green nudges in games. And that's either through raising money for projects on the ground, raising awareness, getting them to speak up. Um, for the industry as well, it's also a way to learn how to become carbon neutral, if not carbon negative. So Supercell, a couple of years ago, created a model around how they as a studio can um, offset their, their carbon emissions. And over the years, the, the Alliance members have taken this on and added to it. Um, there's lots of work that still need to be done on it because on the gaming side, you know, you've got kind of how players are consuming energy, you as a studio, the employees, um, but then there's lots under, you know, you, I think we're just kind of seeing the top of the iceberg. There's lots under at the bottom, probably about 90% under the iceberg that we still need to tackle. But the point of the Alliance is to come together to share ideas 
and to share resources to try and speed this up so that we can become a carbon neutral, if not carbon negative industry and quickly um, and bring our players together to, to take action. Um, so this is just a, 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 you know, a quick summary of some of the things that we've done so far. So it's the, the Green Game Jam, I'll, I'll talk about that in just a second, but that's come out of the, um, come out of the Alliance. Um, we're making real world impact. Um, the Alliance is growing year on year, although we've had to stop taking members on at the moment because we've got a new membership model that's kicking in. Um, we're looking at innovative ways to decarbonize. Um, examples of some of the impact are, you know, planting trees or raising money. Um, and I won't read this all out, but you can start to see like some of the some of the impact that's been made. So this was from 2021. The Alliance actually launched in um, 2019 um, and the end of 2019. So we've done quite a lot in a, a short, short amount of time. Um, and uh, oops, sorry, I just can't see my screen. Um, so I mentioned about the Green Game Jam and uh, what this is, is basically out of the Alliance, we realized that we need a moment in time to kind of bring everyone together. And rather than create a jam, which is a kind of a weekend of thinking about ideas and creating like little games, how can we bring everyone together over a period of time and help some of the biggest games in the world to integrate green content into their games and really take significant action? So the point of the jam was to bring people together to have experts come in for a few weeks to talk to them about particular themes. So this year it was um, food and forests. Um, so a studio then picks the theme that they want to um, concentrate on, attend the sessions around, around that particular topic, and then they go off and they think about how they're gonna integrate that topic into their games. With the majority of games um, launching their activations in June around World Environment Day, but depending on the platform, it could be later. So mobile was kind of quickest to get up and running. PC and console tend to follow later on in the year. Um, so we've got some activations that are actually going live now from this year. And then we're also gearing up for the Green Game Jam for next year, uh, which will then kick off in March. So it will kick off in March. So we've got March, April, May, June, they go live. Um, and onwards, there'll be other activations that go live. Um, but this year, I mean, one of the things that we've been doing uh, at Playmob is because, we, because we're all about insights and data, we've been looking at um, how players are responding to the green game activations. And ultimately we want to see, are we, are we nudging behavior? Um, we want to see how players felt pre and post activation. So before they see something in a game and then afterwards, how do they feel about it? Um, so we've been doing this in conjunction with Unity and we're looking at how we can make this bigger for 2023 onwards to do a more longitudinal study on behavioral transference. Um, but in terms of some of the responses we've been seeing so far, we're seeing that you know 83% of respondents think that gaming can teach you something about the environment. Um, so that's a really, really high positive number. 52% um, said they'd like to see more content in games. 8.7% said they wouldn't. That's totally normal. What we'll typically see is, um, a small percentage of the very, very hardcore who like want to do more, a small percentage, which will be the people who are, don't want to do anything, that's fine, that's up to them. And then the biggest portion in the middle are the people who are indifferent, who we ultimately want to try and get more um, educational messages to and try and nudge and change their behaviour in a positive direction. Um, we're seeing kind of over 70% of people who want to see more content in games with 26% said they want to see it frequently. They'll be the hardcore ones with 55% saying every so often. 67% um, think that an environmental crisis will impact them in their lifetime. Um, and 53% of those um, uh, that completed the survey followed up, um, followed a link to find out more information. So at the end of the survey, they're able to do more. Um, so over half of the respondents said, click that link to be able to do more. Um, and just on this slide as well, that just something that I thought would be interesting as well as you, um, the colours are the um, SDGs, this is UN Sustainable Development Goals. And so what we were finding here was that um, the, the two highest, uh, th these, these, were the number, these were the percentages of games supporting the SDGs. Um, 
So you'll see that the um, health and well-being and life on land were the two highest, being goal number three and goal number 15. Um, so this was a study we did in 2019, just to look at the industry and what we were doing already. But life and land uh, on land was one of the one of the highest, um, and health and well-being was kind of on par with that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I talked a bit about the Green Game Dam, so I won't go too much into that. But um, yeah, so we we had over over 50 participants because Ubisoft had four, 15 game studios um, involved as well. Um, so it was one of the biggest jams that we've ever done. If you're interested in looking at the types of activations, um, you can go on to the Playing for the Planet Alliance website and you'll be able to see the Green Game Jam activity. Um, and then in June, when they go live, what we do is we have, a, have an award um, with different categories. Um, so you'll see, um, so you'll see here we've got, so the UNEP choice was Haiti. Um, they did a, a theme around food, which fitted really well into um, Haiti, uh, which was a really cool activation. Um, we had a media choice, most adoptable, we had players choice, um, best in food, best in forests. They were the two themes or categories for this year, the participants choice, and then the first to implement, so the first studio to go live. Um, so we have the awards in June. Um, when we look at all the activations that are going to go live um, and it's just an extra way of kind of shining a light on those that are really kind of going all out on their activations but you'll be able to go into the website and see all 50 activations um, so if you're interested in playing the games some of the activations may be continuous they may still be live they may not be um, but they're all the games that participate year on year so if they if they did do something that was time-based um, chances are that they'll do something next year um, so if you want to have a look at their games and keep an eye on them. Um, but I mean, essentially, the, the way that games are activating are in three categories, as we see. So one is around where, awareness. So they're doing things like putting content and storylines into their games, um, creating characters and themes, interesting visuals um, so that they can help people remember um, in-game messaging so that messaging will pop up and keep reminding players or they could be using advertising as a way to raise, raise awareness of the topic. Um, some are doing fundraising in a number of different ways. So most of, most of them, would, if it's fundraising, it's going to be in-app purchase. So buy an item in a game, percentage of money goes to charity. Some will do downloadable content, so DLC in-game. Um, some will do premium games. So if you go to the App Store and you'll see you have to pay $5.99 for a game, then after 30% goes to Apple. Um, a percentage of that could then go to charity. Um, some are using goals or, or actions within games to equal a, a corporate donation. So reach level 10 and we'll plant a tree or you know, do something in game and we'll take action. Um, another interesting model is turning soft currency to hard currency. So soft currency is a currency that is earned, but then um, giving the players an opportunity to then say, right, I've got a thousand coins in game that I've earned. I want to donate that to charity and that might equal 10 pounds or 10 dollars 10 euros um essentially that's time that the player has spent um but it's coming from the the corporate um and then the other uh, the third side is around kind of data and insights so this is around finding out what players care about um, finding out a bit more about their behaviors and looking at if we're nudging or changing behaviors or collecting information from players to find out what they care about which could then be used for developing more content aligns to what people want or just generally finding out um, information from players on how much they care or want to know about the topic. Um, so just in the next few minutes, I just wanted to run through a few other examples. I know I've kind of talked a lot about kind of climate action and a lot of the work that we've been doing, but there's other kind of interesting examples that have been um, used in the industry. Um, and this is, a. Uh, some may recognize this, some may be wondering what this is, but there's a really interesting game called Fold It, Fold.it. And it's a game that's been around for years and years, got millions of people playing, and it's about protein folding. So you can basically fold proteins in different ways to solve problems. And it's been used for trying to see if we can so solve problems in the medical space. One example is um, scientists have used it already for, for seeing if we could um, 
well, essentially there was a, a disease, I can't remember the name of it, but it was kind of like a, a an AIDS-like disease that was found in monkeys. And it took about 15 years for scientists to figure out uh, uh, how to resolve this. Um, but gamers who played Folded did it in about 30 days. It was really quick because there were so many people online folding proteins. So they're looking at, you know, can they use this to try and uncover um, uh, cures for cancer? So it's quite revolutionary, revolutionary when it comes to kind of medical research. Um, so definitely one worth checking out. Um, another one slightly different is See Here Request. It's a really, really cute game to play as well, but it's for dementia. Um, and it basically gives, um, when you open the game, it gives you a map that you have to memorize. And then you sail around the map by using your memory. Um, so you don't see the map, but you've got your boat and you have you know, di different routes that you can go. So it's, it's testing your memory. What it's trying to do is kind of test early signs of dementia. Um, but also every so often it asks you for some information about yourself. So um, age, gender, um, I think it's got things about lifestyle. And what they're trying to do is, again, kind of crowdsource this information, whether it be behavioural or um, by asking questions to feed into um, scientific research around dementia and see if we can identify early onset dementia sooner um, and try and figure out a, a resolution to it as well. Um, this is slightly different. This one is, is called um, Bury Me My Love and it's, um, it's, quite a, it's quite an emotional game. It's about um, refugees from Syria and the way that you play it is kind of like through a text-based game, like you're texting someone and you have to make different decisions. And it's about um, uh, the refugee, it's about a couple who are, are split up and are trying to find each other again on their journey um, to a safer place. And it's, um, so it's just, it's to highlight the, the journey that um, refugees, you know, if you're coming from a war torn area, the journey that the refugee has to go on and, um, it's a really fascinating one to play and there's different outcomes as well, depending on the different decisions that you make. So it takes time to play, um, but it's really gripping. Um, so definitely check it out if you, if you get the chance. Um, and just another one I wanted to mention was um, World of Warcraft. So this was a, you know, a long time ago, I think it was about 10, 12 years ago. World of Warcraft was used by scientists to look at um, pandemics and viruses. So what happens, how, how do we behave when a, a virus um, is, uh, happens, when a pandemic hits? And the scientists have modeled different types of behavior, like, um, you know, when you drop in a virus, um, some people are, you know, they're scared, they won't log back in, some people will because they, they think they're immune to it, so they just log in, but then they catch it. Um, but one of, the, one of the behaviors they hadn't modeled was around curiosity, people just wondering what might happen if they pop back in, you know, will they catch it, will they not? Um, so it was able to help scientists understand the behaviours around um, pandemics and viruses. Now, this was a long time ago, um, but it's interesting to see that, you know, we um, <laughs> the game could have perfectly predicted how we were going to react um, when the pandemic hit for real. Um, and I think we're only, only going to see more of not just games doing good, but a demand for, for games to do, to, to go, to do good. And like I mentioned earlier, I think this is really down to conscious consumerism. Um, you know, we've got consumers buying products and services that we're much more savvy when it comes to looking at how ethical products are. Um, and just, you know, following on from the, um, the, the point about COVID, I think this is really interesting to see that, you know, some 80% of people would personally do as much for climate as they, as they have done for COVID-19 recovery efforts. It's just we have to be presented with the right opportunity. And I think games present us with a, a really kind of unique but massively scalable way to take action um, and take it into our own hands. You know, if we get the industry behind it, which is really exciting. So typically we're seeing about kind of 50% of consumers influenced by socially conscious brands. So I think we'll see much more um, uh, brands, not just games kind of come into the market with, uh, with purpose. And people will spend more for socially conscious products or services. Um, and we see this in gaming as well, where players will spend more for items which are to do good, um, because typically it's it's not a, it's not a high value item. It might be a couple of dollars, five dollars. And so, you know, if if spending 
five dollars versus three dollars means that you're going to make impact um people are, are likely to do it because because of the outcome it will have um and just some of the stats as well these are slightly older but if you want to if you're interested in the whole area of consumer um, conscious consumers the have asked the agency the meaningful brand in, index is really interesting to to um to watch it shows that um you know meaningful brands are um are taking up more more wallet so you can charge more there are more brands more people spending more money on ethical brands than ever before um and just some of the some of the bigger brands kind of getting into the space as well like you know diageo um uh, are saying that you know they're making purpose branding work for them and you've got the likes of unilever who used to have 50 percent of their um sustainable living plan brands um make an impact but then they saw they were the most profitable so now it's 100 percent of what uh, brands within unilever are on a sustainable living plan um and we're seeing the likes of you know johnson and johnson and we're seeing it all over the place now but you know in gaming it's no different so the why now is because you know this is a there are big problems to solve but also it's there's a direct correlation between good brands doing well and this is definitely translating into the games industry as well so just going to end on that that quote again just so that you remember um and i think one thing i hadn't forgotten uh, what one thing i forgot to mention at the beginning was there's 21 billion hours we're at the tipping point now so there are um 3.2 billion people playing games in the world for an average of seven hours per week so we're at that 21 billion and so that's why we're starting to see the likes of um you know that the alliance really starting to take off and real impact really starting to happen and more games coming into the space for good um because um we've got enough volume of players enough access to people the conscious consumer is there so all the elements are there to to make this to make games for games for purpose or games for impact really really make a difference um so i realize i've been talking for <laughs> quite a while um and i just wanted to stop because we've got about 10 minutes left now so um i'm actually just going to stop sharing now so i can see my whole screen and see people um but yeah if anybody's got any questions please feel free to ask away or i'm going to have a look in the um chat and see if there are any questions but yeah the floor is now open to everyone all right Jude, um, thank you it's it's you know it's always easier when you try to summarize your 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 journey of a whole lot of years and mm. you get to summarize it to people in 40 minutes it's always <laughs> sweet when we hear it because we always hear the good part the sweet part we forget the process the journey some of the yeah. challenges the mistakes but thank you very much and i'm very sure so many people have questions because me myself i've got two questions but let's hear from some of my colleagues. So if anyone has any question, you can signify if you want to speak to Jude directly, but if you know you don't want to do that, you can drop it in the chat box. So the floor is open now. You can ask as many questions as possible. Okay. Jude is ready to answer us today. Yeah, all right. So um, my name is Kenneth. I, I just want to ask um, just one question about that. Yep. So um, people who have, um, so someone like me, I'm actually, my background is software engineering and uh, software programming. So how easy is it for someone like me to transit from typical software development to, to gaming? Um, that's a really good question. I mean, it, I guess it depends on, on what part of software development you're in, but um, typically, um, typically it should be quite a smooth process you know there's there's lots of different parts of there's lots of different ways you can get involved in the industry um on on the engineering side so i think you know are, are you coming from have, have you just learned have you got experience or no um okay so, so for someone like me i have um, over 10 years experience in um dot net programming um right. so i do typical dot net but i don't develop apps but I do a lot of backends, APIs, and the rest right. of them. But I haven't been involved in anything um, gaming before. Yeah, so I think 
I think the thing about gaming is, um, so I think your, your skills are definitely, definitely transferable. So if you want to get into the industry, then, you know, go for it. Um, and, you know, we're always kind of desperately looking for um, for good people, good skills. I think the, the one thing about the industry, just some advice would be, um, you know, don't be don't be put off by it seeming closed because it's not. Um, it, it can seem quite daunting in terms of where do you start? Once you're in the industry, it is a very big kind of open family. And, you know, I've been in it for 20 years and it's kind of like, one of these industries once you're in it you'll never get out <laughs> um mm. but it's fun it's a lot of fun but i think the you know what you could do is um you know you could pick up with me separately after this and i'm happy to make introductions for you or you know just get your cv out to organizations um find yourself a good mentor or start going to events as well there'll be um you know any of the gaming events i say you know put yourself out there i I meet a lot of people who are not from the games industry who want to get into the games industry and when they come to events you know as soon as you make a few connections that starts to snowball and as, as you, you just need to put yourself on the radar um basically and once you're in you know i think that's then the good thing about the industry is that it's so helpful in terms of you might meet a studio who aren't hiring but know another studio who are so then they'll put you in touch with them so it's really about kind of building up your connections and network and putting yourself out there and um you know, so I wouldn't worry about not having experience of being in a games studio before, but if there's something you want to do and you want to learn and then um, it's a very kind of open, inclusive industry. So, um, but I can pick up with you afterwards about the sorts of events that you could attend or people that you can talk to. Okay, all right, thank you very much. No oh, problem. Yeah. yeah, we can have Farin, Farin Abdul, Abdullah. Yeah, you can ask your questions. Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank thanks, you. Jade. Thank you for uh, this uh, lovely presentation. I think um, so this audience, I think a lot of us are from the technical software development background. So uh, what I'd like to know is uh, the kind of skills um, that, you know, PlayMob is looking to fill in uh, with the new hires. And uh, so my colleagues and I, uh, what's the best possible way we can get associated with the company after the session? Yeah, yeah, and a great question. So we are hiring. <laughs> so this is perfect. Um, so <laughs> uh, I didn't expect this to be an outcome for today, but this is a this is a you know a good a good bonus. Um, so we we're looking for back end and uh, there's three roles actually: a back end engineer, front end engineer, and a data scientist. Mm -hmm. So if you um, and there's there's job ads as well that we can we're happy to share around and just see if you um, if you fit those or would like to have a go. Um, so we, you know, happy to share those. And then, if you if you're interested, then uh, we have a um, we have a recruitment email address that you would just get in touch with, and then we'll take you through the process of um, interview from that point. So um, we're looking to hire those roles probably in the next two to three months. Um, so we've got a little bit of time, but we've got um, some um, interesting work that kicks off next year that we need to basically, you know get good developers in for it to help us out. But yeah, back in and front end engineer and data scientist are the three roles, but more detail in the job description that I share. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, sure, thanks. Uh, another question, Jude, I had. So uh, you mentioned that, you know, uh, I, uh, I also took that quiz yesterday. So it asked for uh, the demographics, the age. So, uh, so the perception has been like uh, the, youngs, the young ones, they are contributing more towards the gaming industry. So, uh, so the data that you collect uh, is the perception correct that it's coming more from the young ones, or like what kind of age group is contributing more? No, so actually, we, funnily, I did have a slide about kind of the age breakdown, and I took it out before the before the presentation. Um, but I think it's um, there, there's a I guess there's a lot that needs to be demystified about the games industry, and that is that the average age now of a gamer is thirty seven. Um, so the biggest portion of gamers are between eight, eight, age 18 to 35 and the smallest percentage are under 18. Um, but the 20% of gamers are actually over 50. Um, and so when we when we roll out uh, an initiative, which, which is to collect insight, if we're going broad, you know, we're not doing a target on a particular age group. It's really interesting mm -hmm. to see who, who comes back. So we did this recently with a, a water company in a particular area for looking at water issues. And um, the, the biggest portion of gamers that were playing were in the 55 to 65 age categories. So 
you know, you've got, you know, we, we can't collect data on anyone that's under 13, basically. So, um, you know, there's an, an, an assumption that the younger kids play older kids games, but um, we see kind of from 13, you know, upwards, you, you know, it's such a, a broad demographic these days. Um, and also on the gender side, it's, it's about 50-50 male, female, although a lot of social gaming and mobile gaming is more women play than men. Um, so the, yeah, so it's, it's not a typical, you know, teenage boy playing war games in his bedroom as, uh, as, as most people kind of presume. Um, but yeah, I mean, so if we, if we need to reach a particular age group, a particular demographic, then that can, can be done by looking at particular games. So each game will have their own set of demographics. Um, so that you know, the, so the demographics I mentioned are, are quite broad, but you'll typically see you know, certain age groups or um, genders gravitate towards certain games. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's very very broad, is what I'm trying to say. But average age being 37, and that that average age will go up over time as well, because for anyone who started playing games in the 80s or 90s, you know, the they they tend to still be playing now, especially mobile gaming. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. No problem. Thank you. Maria, can you help me? Hey, George, this is Santos here. I have a question. I have a question. Oh. I have a question, G. Yeah, go on, go on. Take it one after the other. Santos. Okay. Yeah. So, will there be any openings for gaming testers? Oh, sorry. The line wasn't that clear. Will there be any opening for gaming testers? Is there an opportunity for gaming testers? Are you saying game testers or game investors? Game, yeah, yeah, yeah. gaming uh, testers. You're right. Investors. How to find game investors? Thank you. Can you start your question, please? He said if there is going to be any opening for game investors. I, I don't understand that. Like Game testers. Game testers. Game testers. Or oh, testers. Yeah. 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 So, so, yeah. I mean, there's the game testing is a massive thing. So um, whether it be done kind of directly within studios or publishers, you know, you can test games. Um, there are actually QA companies as well that do a lot of the testing on behalf of publishers and developers so that publishers and developers don't do it themselves. Um, so you can look at QA companies um, and they'll typically take the game through all the kind of quality and assurance. Um, and, that, and that also includes having groups of game testers testing games. Um, I'd have to say, it's, I think it sounds more glamorous than what it is. <laughs> it's a... Uh, it is fun if you like playing games, but you could end up playing the same game a thousand times um, because, you know, you're going through the process of trying to under, uncover bugs and note them all down. And then once you've done that, you have to go through it again and again and again. So it's um, it's fun if you like that sort of thing. You know, if you're a very kind of detailed person, then go for it. Um, but just kind of flagging it out there that you will play the same game a thousand times. But if you're interested in that space, um, the I would, I would probably go down the QA route then directly to publishers, um, purely because most developers and publishers will um, hire a firm to do it for them. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, I would like to speak about uh, a gaming idea that could help with health and well-being. So I don't know if we can actually have a discussion so that I don't take too much time here in this space. Any idea? Yeah, well, just um, message me on LinkedIn and we can pick it up there. All right, thank you. Um, Maria, Maria, quickly. Okay. Thank you so much, Jude. Um, this is not a question per se. I just want to say that this has been very inspiring and um, oh, insightful. You. Now, the take home for me now was that the approach you used to um, implement this which was a kind of like an impact led approach. I believe that is why, you know, it receives much acceptance from the gamers mm. because there was something they could give back. Mm. You know, the human side was involved and that is quite interesting to me because I've never seen gaming in that light. 
well seen from the play aspect, you know, and also the massive insights into human behavior is something worth exploring. And I, I would want to reach out in that aspect, the human yeah, side to human behavior and how humans and people behave using game as a pedestal. Thank you. Yeah, and if you're interested in that space, definitely get in touch because I think you know we're we're kind of looking at how we build more science and social science and behavioral science into into what we do. So yeah, we'd love to explore that with you. Yeah, um, I think um, Maria took the words right out of my mouth because um, this has been really enlightening. I never, for one, um, I didn't know how this particular um, this particular November to remember talk would um, apply to me. Um, but I've always worked in the social utility space and it's it's mind blowing that gaming, um, I never saw gaming side to side with social issues mm. and, and seeing how um, what you're doing helps sustainable development goals. And I, I, I'm really, um, I'm, I'm impressed and it's something that I would like to learn more about. So I guess maybe I'll um, just look at what you've been up to and then I'll take you from there. I'll yeah, check you out nice. on LinkedIn too. But thank you so much. This is a fantastic <laughs> episode for me. Oh, amazing. Thank you. I'm really pleased to hear that. And I'm glad it's been helpful. Yeah. Thank you so much. Like we, as on that social aspect, you see, we have, uh, we currently have an agreement, you know, not really an agreement kind of, but, uh, you know, and uh, a funding, you know, EU funding that we have applied. So we're actually going to use the game to talk about some social issues in the EU. So from February, the uh, Playmob is working with about six other partners to make this uh, work out. But before then, um, can you pull that out? The moderator, do you have any other thing to pull out? Uh, yes, let me just, uh, okay. Let me share, let me share a screen and then good. I don't know if you can see this. That's the Jude Owe. We have a virtual uh, trophy to you <laughs> to say thank you for coming. We appreciate you. I will send this to the mail later, you know, to our November to remember. On behalf of uh, Sam Johnson, head of school, she's likely going to meet you soon. You know, she right. just unavoidably absent with uh, a kind of in another meeting with the with the school, you know. So we are going to talk more. Our students are interested, like I told you the other time, in terms of partnering, you know, knowledge exchange mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, where they will come to do internship. Most of our students are extremely you know, intelligent in back end and front end. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that. Like Kenneth that have 10 years experience, I have for him and so many others. So they are there. And I told them the best way to get into because they are still students is to have this internship. You know, so we will talk about yeah. that later on where we, you can use them for exactly what you know you want to go in and then eventually, you know, I'll see their potential you know, and then we can talk from there. So thank you very much. This is our work for you. We appreciate you. Thank you for coming. Amazing. Thank you I for coming. Mm. I'm going to put it on my LinkedIn. Yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sending it immediately. I appreciate okay, everyone. Yes, thank you for the moderators. Thank you, Jude. Thank you for all. You know, we have a whole set of classes that joined up, mm -hmm. you know, we have group. So a whole lot of students are in classes now joining up to this uh, presentation and uh, they are all excited, you know. So we appreciate you. Thank you for coming and hope we can work more together as we are already planning and working. Thank you. Definitely. Thank you thank so you. much, everyone. Thank you for your feedback. Okay. Talk soon. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jude. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.